Isaiah 48 from verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. All of you, assemble yourselves and hear. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants also would have been like the sand and the offspring of your body like the grains of sand. His name would not have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. And they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Let's pray once again. O God of Jacob, O God of Bethel, O God of Israel, will you bless us? Will you show us your redemption and your provision again this morning? Will you reveal your glory and your goodness to us most holy and heavenly Father, will you assure our hearts? Will you guide us in your way? We ask it through Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Christian brother, sister, when has God ever ceased to supply all your needs? When have you ever needed his mercies and found him absent? When has he turned his back upon you? When in time of trouble has he abandoned you? Put the question the other way around. What is God's heart toward you? What favour, what mercy, what blessing has he poured out upon you? How faithful he has been, how patient, how kind, and how good. So that at your most difficult and darkest moments, at your lowest and most painful points, he has proved himself abundantly then to be God and your God. So what are your thoughts of him? If he has never let you down, if he has never turned against you, if he has always blessed you and supplied his goodnesses toward you, how do you perceive him? What do you think of your redeemer and his redemption? What is your disposition and your testimony concerning the God of your salvation? Isaiah speaks on God's behalf to a people who had hard thoughts of the God who had delivered them, the God who would deliver them, the God who had made such rich promises toward them. And brothers and sisters, those hard thoughts grieved the heart of Almighty God. There is a sense in which, through Isaiah, he often pleads his manifest goodwill. He lays again and again the, the history of his dealings before the people and he reminds himself who he is and how he has acted toward them. 
Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called ones, my people, my beloved, the ones that I have beckoned to myself and drawn into my embrace. I am he, I am the first, I also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. Then verse 17, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. He's speaking here to a people in exile, a people for whom he was going to raise up a man called Cyrus. And he is promising to this people deliverance from exile in Babylon by Cyrus. It's as if a message were to come to somebody who's been living in a prison camp to say soon the gates will be flung open and you will go forth with abundance of blessing and you will go back to your homeland with joy. And they didn't believe him. They didn't think it could happen. They didn't think it would happen. They didn't believe that God was able to accomplish what he had promised. In this respect, they were not unlike the wilderness generation. In that case, God had provided deliverance from bondage in Egypt. He'd brought them up with his strong right arm and with his mighty right hand. He had brought the entire nation out of the bondage of Egyptian slavery. And they'd gone out with the blessings of Egypt on, on their bodies and in their baggage. Uh, they plundered Egypt without once raising a sword. And in both cases... To the great grief of the Almighty God, the people were marked by suspicion and by grumbling and by complaint. And that is why the Lord loves to put before his people how he acts and why he acts in the way that he does. We read at the beginning from Psalm 78 and verse 15. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? The wilderness generation knew the abundant blessings of God and they suspected whether or not God could or would continue to do them good. The exile generation with these rich and precious promises before them, behaved in precisely the same way that the wilderness generation had done. They suspected the good heart and the gracious hand of God. They grumbled and complained. And it is for that reason that the Lord takes them back to the Exodus generation and reminds them that they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. I suggest to you that when God's people have fallen into the same sinful pattern twice, it is good for us to heed the remedy that God provides. It's good for us to remember what God has done, what God has accomplished, and what he has yet promised. To remember the heart of God toward us and to rejoice over the redemption that we have received and the provision that God has promised. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. Remember then, first of all, where the people were. Where the people were. They were in the deserts. They were in the dry wastes. The place 
is harsh. The environment, inhospitable. If I say to you deserts, even today, you typically think of dry and hot. Even if it's rocky or sandy, uh, even if it's cold uh, sometimes, especially at night. But dryness, difficulty in obtaining provisions and resources. They were in the deserts. And then the people around them, they were persecutors and enemies. Egypt was behind and around them were the kind of people that we've been reading about in those chapters in Numbers. You've got the Moabites. You've got the, the men who are looking to call down curses upon the people of God who want to do everything in their power to hinder or destroy them. In terms of provision... It is seemingly scant and they can be deeply distressed. So much so that even when in Psalm 78 God gives them water, their response is, well, the water's fine, but where are we going to find food to eat? The staggering, isn't it, that they've been given these gushing waters and they don't give thanks to God. They rather suspect whether or not God can do anything more or different or better. The place is inhospitable. The people around them are opposed to them. The provision is seemingly scant, but there was a purpose from the beginning. Notice how Isaiah speaks on God's behalf. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. See, so often our instinct can be to look at the deserts and to forget the God who has led us there. God had redeemed his people. And God would not abandon his people. He didn't bring them up out of Egypt and then leave them to perish at the side of the Red Sea. He led them through the waters. And having come through the waters, he did not then leave them at the beginning of the wilderness. But rather he went before them. He was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by the day. They never were alone, even in the desert places. And there was a purpose in what God did. Remember how he spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God, here's the language again, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Notice that there is a, an immediate and then an ultimate purpose, to humble you, in order that through my provision for you, you might know that you can rely upon me. He went on, your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose very stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. God says, I've redeemed you, and I'm bringing you to the richest of all imaginable places. But in between are the deserts. In between the wilderness. In between the dry places. And notice that God doesn't say, I'll redeem you and eventually you're going to make it. He says, I have led you. And I've led you in such a way that step by step you will learn both your dependence upon me and my willingness and ability to supply every need you have in those dry places. It is a reminder for us 
that the life of God's people is marked typically by sufferings and sorrows. We are now in the dry places. The environment is a hostile one. It is spiritually dry and hot and hard. The people around us have no sympathy for the pilgrims who are making their way toward the celestial city, the promised land. The provision that we have, humanly speaking, can appear so scant and our distress can be so real. But God is leading you. God is with you. God will not depart from you. I think it is worth remembering, too, that some of these challenges can follow hard on the heels of particular blessings. You might have thought, Israel might have wished, that having been delivered from Egypt, they would have a bit of respite. They've been slaves for hundreds of years, and now they're being brought up out of the land of Egypt. And they've been given all these gifts, they've plundered Egypt, and out they come. And you might have thought, right, what we really need, humanly speaking, what would you say after a period like that? Okay, we need a period of consolidation. That's where we talk after a crisis, isn't it? We just need to give ourselves a bit of breathing space. We just need to slow down for a bit, take things easy, and make sure that we get our act together, start thinking clearly, and once we've regained our own strength, then we'll be able to press on. What did Israel face? The Red Sea before them and the Egyptian army behind them. Why? That they might learn that the God who had redeemed them would take care of them. And where was he going to lead them? They weren't going to cross the Red Sea into the Promised Land. The Promised Land was on the far side of the Jordan and that was some distance away before you even begin to take into account the lessons that they needed to learn because they would not trust the Lord their God and began to yearn for the, the flesh and the vegetables that they'd enjoyed in Egypt. I think it's worth remembering that sometimes it is not long after conversion that the devil roars in against us. It may be that we'd have thought that the wrestling of that period would have been quite enough for us. But sometimes God, in his mercy and goodness, teaches us very soon after that we always and utterly depend upon him. Brothers and sisters, you'll find the same whenever you are perhaps made aware of some new sphere of obedience. If there's a point of reformation in your life, God, by his word and spirit, brings to bear upon you some precept that you've not previously understood. God peels back the layers on some area of your life where you've been falling short. Or as you plead and pray with God, you're determined that now you're going to step up in some particular point. That you're going to be a man or a woman who follows God with a whole heart. Perhaps in this or that particular area. This or God, in dependence upon you, I want to make this better. I want to get this right. From now on, I do not want to be this kind of man, but this kind of believer. Not this kind of woman, but someone who follows you wholeheartedly in this respect. And when you get a hold of yourself by the scruff of the neck, what do you typically find? That's the hardest week you've ever known. <laughs> Sick in body, perhaps. Frail in spirit. Tempted in ways that you'd not begun to consider. It can seem as if Satan is coming against you at the very point at which you've said, that's where I want to work harder. Perhaps you hear a sermon about prayerfulness. You think, oh God, I, my prayers so recently, they've been feeble and few and I need to pray. You know, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be up tomorrow morning perhaps or I'm going to set aside time during the day. I'm going to devote myself to prayer in a way that I haven't. Do you find that an easy week to pray? Perhaps you become conscious that your tongue has been running away with you. That it's been harsh or, or vulgar and you think, no, I, I need to bring my speech under control. I want to speak as a man of God, as a woman of God, with grace and with, with mercy, with holy restraint. I want my, my tongue to be not a weapon, but rather a tool for the building up and the doing of good to others. Do you not typically find that that's the very week that you face more provocations than you can ever... Maybe it's because you're a little more sensitive to it. 
But I think it's the case that very often when we begin some particular course of reformation, or even when we begin to understand, when we're brought out of darkness into light and we're seeking to live in the way that pleases God, those can be the very moments at which we are most struggling. My friends, if you're a Christian, you're in the desert places. You're in the dry wastes. That is the norm. It is a difficult environment and there are particular challenges. That's where the people were. Consider then how the people felt. What should they have been doing? This is what God says. Go forth from Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. When the people of God went up out of Egypt, they should have gone singing and dancing. When the people of the exile went out from Babylon, they ought to have gone declaring to the nations, look at what God has done for us. The Lord has done great things for us. And for that reason, we are glad. We're the people who have been delivered from bondage. We've been brought out from those stinking Babylonian canals that we were camping by. We've been able to go out into the world with a view to our return to the place of God. We're like prisoners who've been released from their cells. We're like those who've been let out of the, the camps. And Isaiah is telling them, the Lord is speaking to them, and he says, I'm going to use Cyrus to bring you home. I'm going to raise up the, the man that you would never have imagined. And I'm going to use him to, de to deliver you and to bring you back to your appointed place. Like Israel, redeemed from Egypt, and the promised land is ahead of you. God has said, I will deliver you, I will take care of you, and I will bring you to my appointed place where you will have all the blessings that I have promised toward you. You see, the liberation of God's people was meant to be a witness to the watching world. They were meant to see what God had done. And not only were they to hear Israel singing, but they were to recognize that these were the saving acts of the great God of all the earth. But you can say, look what we have, in two very different tones of voice, can't you? <coughs> look what we have! Look what God has done for us. See how he has redeemed us. Watch as he brings us through the Red Sea. Consider how he provides for us in the dry places. What great things the Lord has done for us. Or you can say, look what we have. Look at what God has done for us. Here we are in the wilderness. Yeah, there's water, but where's the meat? Yes, you're going to raise up this Cyrus, but how can we be sure that you will bring us back to our proper home? My friends, the very thing that ought to have been the delight of God's people became the complaint of God's people. Is that not perverse? The very things that ought to have been the subjects of their songs became the grounds of their complaints. You do have the song of Moses. Let's not overlook that. But it's not long before the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? You hear the reasoning? You've delivered us in order to destroy us. You've brought us up out of Egypt. You've delivered us from slavery. You've brought us out of bondage. You've lavished all these good things upon us. You've brought us through the Red Sea. You've wiped out our enemies behind us. You've given us promises which we don't believe. We think you've brought us here to kill us. You don't really love us. You've got no intention of doing us any good. And Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Notice the continuity. You struck the river, the Red Sea, uh, and, and the, the Nile as well with your rod. Uh, you, sorry, you struck the Nile, you held out your rod over the Red Sea. Go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? It's a fearful question, isn't it? For someone who's just been redeemed to ask. A fearful question for a people who've come out with rejoicing. Is the Lord among us or not? The early experience at the Exodus should have reminded the people of the exile that they had no reason to suspect the wisdom or the goodness of God. Do you not find it remarkable that when the people said, God's brought us out of Egypt to destroy us, God said, give them the water that they need? Is that not patience? Is that not loving kindness? Is that not tender mercy? God's goodness is marvellous. Human doubt is miserable. And yet, brothers and sisters, do we not find ourselves often saying, is God really among us? Does God really intend to do us good? Do you rejoice or do you resent? Are you a singer or are you a moaner? What has God done for you, Christian? What has he provided and what has he promised? And what does he continue to do, even in the face of our doubts and fears? They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. The people were in the deserts. They were in the dry wastes. They felt suspicious. They considered themselves abandoned. They began to believe that God was ready to do them harm rather than good. What did the people enjoy? They did not thirst. And this is one of those points where you get a, a sort of placed in a negative and then you get this a wonderful positive. Now, if you would say this morning, I'm not thirsty. Well, you, you may not be. When did you last have a cup of water or a, a cup of tea? You're not thirsty. If you start thinking about it, I know I sometimes do, but if you start thinking about it, you could actually do with some water. But you're not thirsty. I can drink that, and you're not going to fight me for it. I heard somebody talking about being thirsty the other day. He said it was, it was part of a, a routine that he had to take. It was a, a particular program in which he was involved. He said, by the third day, I could smell water wasn't allowed to drink, I had to cut down. The third day, I couldn't drink at all. And I could smell water. Can you imagine being so thirsty that you can actually smell water? They did not thirst. Far from being in that position, he caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. This was no trickle. This was no dribble. When they went out into the wilderness, they did not thirst. Far from it. The Lord was pleased to make the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. And it may be here that, that there's to be a, a sense of the, the freshness and the fullness of this. Have you ever found the water gushing from a rock? Have you ever had a spring that really leaps out of the ground and it comes out, it's living water, it's flowing, it's gushing, it flows forth. It's crystal clear and cool and refreshing. And that's the emphasis here. It is the consistent picture of marvellous provision. 
If you go back just a few chapters to chapter 35 and verse 6, you have a similar piece of imagery. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. When you have water that comes from a rock in the desert, when you have these great rivers flowing through the wilderness, you ought to be thinking, this is miraculous, this is wonderful. What provision has been made for us? Every step of the way, he caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. It's a picture then of God's willingness and ability to supply every need you have even before you've reached the promised land. Yes, dry wastes now. Yes, sometimes desert periods now. But remember who has brought you forth. Remember the redemption that you have received. Remember the power and the goodness that God has shown in bringing you out of darkness into his light. Remember the strength of his arm when he has plucked you as a brand from the burning. Remember the mercy of his heart when he has looked upon you in your misery and in your sin. Remember how he has dealt with you in making you his child. Remember how he has called you. Remember how he has redeemed you. Remember how he has declared over you, I am the Lord, that is my name. You are mine. I am he. I am the God who has created the heavens and the earth i'm the god who's put the stars in their places why is isaiah so full of the majesty and the holiness of god it is so his people may remember who he is and what he is able to do it is not just that we should stand back and marvel and say he is a great god we should rather stand back and say that is our great god that is what he is like that is what he can do. He is the one who has covenanted to be our God. And if he has saved us, he will keep us. If he has redeemed us, he will supply us. If he has delivered us, he will not ever abandon us. Remember, my friends, that that rock that gushed water in the wilderness was a picture of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. Christ is your rock. The rock has been struck and the waters gush forth. Who was poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost? You have the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. You have life in Christ and the Spirit of God dwelling in your heart. In John chapter 7, Christ talks about the one, and I think he's referring primarily to himself, the one out of whose heart the rivers of water flow. He says, you come and you drink of me. My friends, your soul is sustained by the Christ who has died for you and the spirit who has been given to you. From him flow abundant goodnesses for every step of your pilgrim journey. What are you doing this morning? In heavenly terms, spiritual reality, you're drinking of living streams. You're feeding on bread from heaven because Christ is set before you once again. The word of God has been your portion. You have the privilege of gathering together with the others who are on this same pilgrim journey. And God is supplying your every need. You are not thirsting, though you are in the deserts. You may not have everything that you always expected, but he is leading you. You are not where you are by accident. And if you feel the thirst begin to pinch... If you feel hunger begin to cramp your belly, spiritually speaking, God is the one who causes waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. He leads us by the richest streams. He provides all that we need. And when it looks like provisions are getting scarce, 
and when it seems as if we're about to struggle and when we're not sure how we will be supplied tomorrow. Why has he led us here? Is it so he can kill you? Has he brought you out of bondage to sin in order that he might abandon you in the wilderness? Has he delivered you from hell in order that you might perish in the deserts? Or will he teach you day by day that he can and he will supply your every need? Our Lord taught his disciples not to pray Lord, give us a wagon load of bread so that we can travel for miles and not need to think about you ever again. But give us, day by day, our bread. My friends, we don't know what a day will bring forth. We don't know what dryness may afflict us tomorrow. We don't know what the deserts will hold. We know they're inhospitable. So we know it's not going to be easy. We know that there are persecutors and opposers behind and around. We know that in ourselves we can make no provision. But we cannot lose sight of the purpose, the patience and the kindness of God. We ought to be the people who go through the wilderness singing. Go forth from Babylon, free, flee from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare. Proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Does it honour God when we say or somehow otherwise communicate, the Lord has made us his people in order to destroy us? Is that attractive? Does that entice the world? Is that a God worth serving? Is that a Lord worth honouring? Our God hates us. Our God doesn't like us at all. Our God makes our life miserable. Our God is very harsh. Our God oppresses us. Our God brings us low. Our God starves us. Our God makes our life dreadful. Would you like to be a Christian? <laughs> our God has redeemed us. Our God has brought us up from out of the pit. Our God has made bare his hand. Our God has brought us to himself. Our God who made the heavens and the earth, my friends, has loved us. He has redeemed us. He has given his son to die for us. He has struck the rock and from him flow the streams of living waters. You can look around and say, what a rotten desert. Or you can look down and say, what a glorious provision. It's not that you ignore the fact that you are in the dry places. But you need to remember what Israel so often forgot. That God was willing and able to provide every step of the way. Our testimony is that God has blessed us and has never ceased to bless us. We are his. He has called us by our name. And he will always provide for us. Are you in the desert? Yes. Is the promised land ahead? Yes. How will you get from here to there? What are you sometimes tempted to feel? What might you feel? That God has abandoned you? That God is neglecting you? That God has drawn back from you? That God has no regard for you? If he has given you his son, how will he not with him also freely give you all things? Brothers and sisters, there are streams in the desert. There are flowing waters. 
in the waste places. Ours is the God of the gushing stream. This is what the Lord has proved. His faithfulness and his goodness. His mercy and his truth. His wisdom and his love. And we have at least three places to which we can look in order to be reminded of that. The first is the Exodus. When God brought his people out of Egypt and he provided for them through the deserts and he brought them into the promised land. The second is the exile. When God raised up Cyrus and brought his people out of Babylon and led them under Ezra and with Nehemiah back to the land of promise and established them once again. And the third is the experience of your life up until now. If you're a believer, God has redeemed you. And he has supplied you. Have you sometimes doubted him? Have you sometimes suspected him? Have you sometimes feared that what he has promised will not come to pass? What has been his response? To pour out the waters beside you. He has been most patient with you. When you have complained and when you have grumbled, he may have chastised, but he has never ceased to supply. He has been most generous. My friends, perhaps sometimes we should think less of what we have received and more of what we have deserved. Where might I be in Egyptian bondage? Where do I deserve to be in Babylonian slavery? Am I entitled to heaven? Not by any stretch of the imagination. If the Lord, as it were, brought me a parched skeleton and just pushed me over the edge into the promised land, would I have anything of which to complain? No, I should be singing every step of the way. But he has not done even that. He has brought us out of darkness and he has made us to walk in the light of his countenance. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He split the rock and the waters gushed out. That means, first of all, that everybody here can trust this God to save you. Here is his goodness. Here is his kindness. Here is his tender mercy. You need a God who is able to bring you out of bondage. You need a God who can deliver you from sin and from death and from hell. You need a God who can break your chains. You need a God who can pay a ransom for your deliverance. You need a God who can bring you up out of the Egypt of your soul. You need a God who can deliver you from the Babylon of your bondage. And if you come to him, if you trust him, then he will be your God and you will be one of his people. And having saved you, he will keep you. My friends, it may be dry and hard for some of us, even today. If not now, we will keep feeling it because this is the lot of the pilgrim in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. But you can trust a God not only to save you, how much more than to keep you. The God of the gushing waters is the God of your salvation. He is most willing. He is most able. And he is leading you every step of the way. There are no accidents upon your path. There is no lostness for the children of God. He has provided for you in the wilderness. What do you think of your God? What is our testimony to the Lord who has redeemed us? With a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, utter it to the end of the earth, 
say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. My friends, our testimony is a glorious one. God has saved you. And God is keeping you. And God will keep you. And God will lead you safely home. Amen.